Welcome to a special edition of Rightly Divided. The, tonight we're going to be doing a little bit different than the usual format where I interview someone and uh, we talk for about 30 minutes. Uh, Pastor Erlebarger is actually going to be giving a lecture tonight. And what is the lecture going to be on? Lecture is entitled Prophet, Priest, and King, the Threefold Offices of Christ. So sit back and uh, enjoy. Well, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Christ Reformed Church in Anaheim. And tonight we are conducting a special lecture. We're talking about one of the most interesting and I think one of the most important themes in Reformed theology. And that is what some of our theologians have called the triple cure. And that is the threefold office of Christ. Christ as prophet, Christ as priest, and Christ as king. Now, if you want to impress your friends at the next uh, cocktail party, your neighborhood barbecue, uh, you can call it the Moonus Triplex, the threefold office. So that's a good one to have filed away to, to use uh, at your, your leisure. Now, the lecture tonight comes from an essay I wrote for Modern Reformation back in 1995. Um, so this has been around for a while, but I'm obviously going to change this for our study tonight. And... Um, it was published for that uh, Christmas issue. We actually did Christmas issues at the time, and uh, we introduced this theme of prophet, priest, and king, and we've talked about this in a number of forums since. So I thought it would be a good idea to, to reintroduce this topic again and let you see why this is such an important part of the Reformed tradition. So with that, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the work of your dear Son. Father, we struggle to put into words the gratitude we feel when we consider that our blessed Savior and Mediator of the Covenant has fulfilled these three wonderful offices of prophet, priest, and king. We're thankful, Lord, that this not only has accomplished redemption for us, but that our Savior, even now as we pray, is fulfilling these three offices. And so we are free to pray. We pray boldly in the name of Christ because... Our blessed Savior has ascended on high, and even now is our prophet, our priest, and our king, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, the bad news is really bad, because we are ignorant, we're guilty, and we're corrupt. Now, as a litany of biblical passages revealed to us, we find ourselves as fallen sinners ravaged by the threefold consequence of our sins. Paul tells us that our foolish hearts are darkened and that our thoughts are continually evil, according to the book of Genesis. Our minds are dark, clouded by sin. We're ignorant of the things of God, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. And yet, despite all of that in our great folly, we boast about our wisdom and our knowledge. Paul tells us that we have exchanged God's truth for a lie in Romans chapter 1, and he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that our minds are blinded by the God of this age. And so, like a blind man in a drunken stupor, we pitifully grope our way through life because our sin has blinded us to the truth of God. And because we're intoxicated by our own self-righteousness, we stumble through life seeking to justify ourselves before God. Now many labor under the tremendous weight of guilt, which is the penalty for our many infractions of the law of God. And while some of us are quite adept at ignoring God's just verdict against us, Others in our midst feel like they're on the verge of collapse, about to buckle under the heavy weight of God's hand. Now, not only are we guilty for our individual violations of God's law in our thinking, in our doing, and in our speech, but we're also rendered guilty for our participation in the sin of Adam, whose guilt has been imputed to all of us who spring from Adam's loins. We are his biological descendants. Adam was our federal head. And we know this from the famous analogy between the two Adams that Paul sets forth in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. And while we may delude ourselves into thinking that we've sinned against our neighbors only, David, the psalmist, knew that this was not true. Against you, and you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. The words from Psalm chapter 51. So because of our guilt, 
There's no way that we can dare stand in the presence of God. The psalmist says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Rhetorical question, we all know the answer. But ignorance and guilt of sin are not the only things in view as we survey the scriptures. We suffer also from the destructive pollution of an inherited sinful condition. It infects every part of us from the moment of our conception. We are born in sin, as the psalmist says in Psalm 51, verse 5, and there is no good residing in us. Our bodies, which the psalmist says are fearfully and wonderfully made, become instruments to act out the wickedness which otherwise would lay hidden in our hearts. It is the guilt and pollution from sin that renders us so miserable. Now, life apart from God's forgiveness is described in the scriptures using the language of sickness. The trembling, sweaty weakness of a sick body trying to fight off a high fever is the image in Psalm uh, Psalm 32. Paul tells us we have no peace with God or neighbor. And as he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, we were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So, sin leaves us ignorant, guilty, polluted, and therefore utterly miserable. Now, the diagnosis is bad, but the prognosis is far worse because this disease is always fatal and no earthly physician has any remote idea about a cure. But there is, however, one account of a glorious and miraculous cure from this disease, and that is the good news of the gospel. Because the gospel tells us that while this cure is impossible with men, all things are, in fact, possible for God. So, let's now take up the development of the threefold office and take a look at how this becomes an important part of the Reformed tradition in response to that uh, very, very dark and dire assessment of human nature. Now, we don't know who the first to use this uh, particular model of the threefold office, the moon is triplex, but Calvin certainly made it a central theme in Reformed theology. Um, and it, it comes to us in the Reformed tradition through Calvin and the Institutes. Now, it's been picked up by most of the subsequent Reformed tradition as kind of an organizing theme. If you pick up a Reformed systematic theology, you'll find Burkhoff, uh, for example, discuss the three offices and, and give major sections to each. If you look at the Reformed Confessions, for example, the Heidelberg Catechism, you'll find the threefold offices spelled out uh, very carefully in that document as well. So it's a, it's a very, very major theme in the Reformed tradition. And um, it's been adopted by the Lutheran tradition as well. And um, you end up taking a large amount of biblical data and qualifying it in such a way that it fits together the relationship of Old Testament to New systematic theology to biblical theology, and it is a a way to make sense of the general thrust of redemptive that ties a lot of loose ends together. So it really has a lot of utility uh, behind it as well. So Calvin adopted this model to accomplish three things, because it grows out of Christ's saving work and the fact that he is anointed to fulfill all of these offices in the Old Testament. So for Calvin, the first thing it does is this threefold office of prophet, priest, and king gives him a way to, to shape his overall Christology that focuses on Christ's saving work in terms of Christ being the mediator of a covenant of redemption. So Calvin is focusing on Christ's mediatorial work, and he uses the threefold offices then to, to kind of flesh that out, because Christ is the one chosen by God to be the savior of the elect. The second thing that Calvin does, he uses this threefold office to bind together Christ's person as the eternal Son of God, fully human and fully divine, to his work as Redeemer, as seen in Christ's titles. Titles we all know, Christ and Messiah. And these themselves are indicative of Christ being the anointed one, that one chosen by God to be the Redeemer of the world and the Savior of the elect. Now, Richard Muller, in his discussion of this, in his uh, Dictionary of Greek and Latin Theological Terms, does a a very helpful job here in summarizing Calvin's position. He says, for Calvin, and quoting Muller now, 
The Son of God, therefore, is not properly called Christ apart from his office. So Calvin always wants to look at Christ's work in the concrete, not in the abstract. We're looking at Christ not apart from his office, but in his office. For it's there, Muller says, in his official capacity, that he manifests as the true fulfillment the offices found in the Old Testament of prophet, priest, and king. So for Calvin, then this becomes a way to talk about Christ in the concrete, in his offices, not in the abstract, which I think is very, very helpful. So what happens is this model gives the Reformed a very excellent way to connect redemptive history to systematic theology. As you know, there's been a long tension in Reformed theology, it's especially acute of the last century or so, between biblical theology, which traces a doctrine as it historically unfolds in the pages of Scripture, and systematic theology, which looks at a doctrine topically. Uh, The famous illustration of Gerhardus Voss is biblical theology is a line tracing something from Genesis through to Revelation, where systematic theology takes the form of a circle. So this helps us connect redemptive history to systematic theology. And since Christ's threefold offices, prophet, priest, and king, represent three offices of ancient Israel, to which men were appointed as servants of God, Calvin then could connect the incarnation directly to Christ's work as mediator. There's a reason why Christ took to himself a true human nature. It was not so much that God could do it, but God did it for a specific reason, to be the mediator of this covenant of grace and our Redeemer. So, the prophet... The king and the priest are united in Christ. Those offices are perfected and thereby fulfilled and brought to conclusion in the one who is both a prophet and a uh, king and a priest, rather, forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so then in this threefold office, Calvin offers an excellent and compelling way to, to make sense of a large block of otherwise diverse biblical data. Now, later Reformed theologians, such as Francis Turretin, in his Institutes of Olympic Theology, he introduces the threefold office of our Lord as the divinely revealed solution to the threefold promise we just mentioned. The human disease, as he depicts it, of ignorance, guilt, and pollution. And so it is Christ as prophet, priest, and king who offers the threefold solution to our fatal condition. And Turretin sets this out as, as follows. This is, I think this is great. Quoting from Turretin. The threefold misery of men introduced by sin, ignorance, guilt, and tyranny, and bondage by sin required this conjunction of a threefold office. Ignorance is healed by the prophetic, guilt by the priestly, and tyranny and corruption of sin by the kingly office. Turretin says, Prophetic light scatters the darkness of error. The merit of the priest takes away guilt and procures a reconciliation for us. The power of the king removes the bondage of sin and death. The prophet shows God to us. The priest leads us to God. And the king joins us together and glorifies us with God. The prophet enlightens the mind by the spirit of illumination. The priest, by the spirit of consolation, tranquilizes the heart And the conscience, the king, by the spirit of sanctification, subdues rebellious affections. So Turretin's conception is not only eloquently stated, which is powerful evidence against the argument that scholastic theology lacks any kind of devotional quality, but it effectually captures the thrust of the biblical data concerning Christ's person and work, which is to rescue us from the horrible consequences of our sin. Well, let's take up the offices individually now, and I'd like to look first at Christ as our prophet. Now, Christ's prophetic office means, in effect, that Christ represents God to man. That's the essence of his prophetic work. He represents God to us. And so, Jesus, not surprisingly, is called the light of the world in the prologue to John's Gospel. He comes, according to John chapter 14, verse 9, he comes to show us God. That's at least part of the work of Christ in his incarnation. Now, under the old covenant, back in the um, Mosaic uh, covenant, the Sinaitic uh, covenant era, Christ taught us by means of types and shadows. 
uh, the priesthood, the temple, the temple, the tabernacle, and so on. He taught us by the history of redemption as we move from uh, the initial prophecy, say in Genesis 3.15, on into the call of Abraham to the Davidic kingship to the later prophets and so on. He's teaching us through the, the general history of redemption and by his providential care over the people of Israel. So by all of these things, Christ is teaching us And since in the Old Testament a prophet is one who sees things, who receives revelations, who is in the service of God, particularly as a messenger who speaks his name, that's the definition of a prophet from Burkhoff, our Lord Jesus then exercised these functions both before and after his incarnation. Uh, We read this in 1 Peter 1, verse 11. Remember it was Moses who told the people of Israel that a great prophet is going to follow. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet for you like me from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So it's the Apostle Peter then who, immediately after the birth of the church, applies that very passage to our Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 23. That prophet, Peter says, that Moses told you to listen to, he's here, he's just been raised from the dead and has taken his place at the right hand of God. Now, it's one thing for Peter to cite that verse and apply it to Jesus, but Jesus speaks of himself as a prophet. Luke chapter 13, verse 33. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So Jesus speaks of himself openly as a prophet. He claims repeatedly to speak only what his father has told him. Uh, John chapter 12, uh, 49 through 50, a number of times following in the uh, discourse regarding the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus speaks of the future, for example, in Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. And one thing people notice about Jesus when he teaches, he teaches with authority unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, not only does he speak prophetic words, but his words are backed by the power of God. That's why he performs miracles, not to impress us, but to confirm the truth of his message, to give authority to his message. And that's a major theme throughout the New Testament. Uh, one passage that sums that up perhaps the best is John chapter 6, verse 14, where we're told that when people saw the sign, the miracle he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who's come into the world. So the miracles that Christ performs are to establish his authority to speak. Now, Christ's prophetic work doesn't cease with the end of his earthly ministry at the time of his ascension. One of the things that you'll notice as you start to look through the the various treatments in Reformed writers of this threefold office is, they'll speak of them in the Old Testament, in the New Testament era, and then on into the present. And I'll, I won't make that distinction so sharp in these lectures, but I'm going to look at things from those three perspectives. So how does Christ's uh, prophetic work continue on today? It, well, it doesn't cease with the ascension. And Burkhoff, I think, does a very helpful job of summarizing this when he says, Christ continues his prophetical activity through the operation of the Holy Spirit. His teachings are both verbal and factual. That is, he teaches not only by verbal communications, but also by the facts of revelation, such as the incarnation, his atoning death, the resurrection, and the ascension. Furthermore, Jesus is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is described as the Spirit of Christ. He is the one, the Holy Spirit, when he comes who will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So as Christ is the Word incarnate, and as He is the central figure in all of biblical revelation, so too we can't divorce the work of the Spirit from the written Word. This is one of the great uh, things to look for as a distinctive of Reformed theology, the, the, the nervousness about separating the work of the Spirit from the Word. Reformed are not comfortable with the Anabaptist tendency to want to see the Spirit operate apart from the Word. We believe the Spirit operates primarily through the written Word. And since Christ then fulfills the office of the prophet, and since he continues to speak to us through his Word, the Reformed then are very reticent to give any credence to those so-called words of God or words of knowledge which our contemporaries will make speaking apart from the authority of Holy Scripture.
So one of the foundations then for our doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture, that the Scripture contains all that we need to know about the law and the gospel, about how to be saved and so on, is because of Christ's threefold office. His prophetic work is to speak to us through his word even uh, today. So we'll be a little nervous about those who claim to speak in the name of Christ apart from Scripture. Now, Christ's priestly work. This is the most obvious of the threefold office. This is the one that people gravitate to because it is probably the uh, central theme in Scripture of these three offices. There's more uh, text devoted to the priestly work of Christ perhaps than to the others. But the priestly office you know, does indeed occupy a major place in the New Testament. And it not only includes the discussion of the office itself, but also of Christ's sacrificial death to redeem sinners from their sin. So when we talk about the threefold office, especially the priestly, we're not only going to talk about Christ's priestly work, when we think of his ascension and his work in the temple, the stuff in, in Hebrews, but we're also going to think of the atonement of Christ's death on the cross. And in Reformed Systematics, you'll find a discussion of the death of Christ being treated under the heading of the priestly office of Christ. And there's a reason for that, because his death is part of his priestly work. So the various discussion of the meaning of things like propitiation and reconciliation and redemption and so on, those headings are usually discussed as a subset of Christ's priestly work. Now the key passage in the New Testament for this is Hebrews chapter 5 and following where the characteristics of a true priest are laid out. First, in Hebrews 5 verse 1, every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. What do priests do? Well, they're appointed by God. Priests don't appoint themselves. You don't decide at 13 you want to grow up and be a priest, well, you have to be in a different church body if, you, if that's your calling. Uh, God appoints priests to represent us to God and to offer gifts and sacrifices. Second, such a priest is appointed by God for that office. And third, the high priest offers gifts and sacrifices for sin. So, the priest then, in doing those three things makes intercession for the people. He's the one who approaches God on our behalf, making intercession, and actually blessing us in the name of God. That's one of the things the priest did as described in Leviticus chapter 9. So this is why the author of Hebrews then can look at the priestly work of Christ and say, this is the high priest par excellence. Jesus is superior to all of the priests of Israel, uh, to the Aaronic priesthood and to the Levitical priesthood as well. Now, tied to this is the fact that the Old Testament promised a coming Redeemer. And the psalmist records God saying about his chosen, this coming one, the chosen one, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, from Psalm 110, verse 4, which I, if I'm not mistaken is the most often cited Old Testament passage in the New Testament. Zechariah, in his prophecy, says that the coming Redeemer, and I'm quoting from Zechariah um, chapter 6, will build the temple of the Lord, he will be clothed with majesty, and will sit and rule on his throne. And he'll be a priest on his throne. And so as Burkhoff points out, then the Old Testament priest, and particularly the high priest, all of that prefigures a priestly Messiah. So the fact that this one is going to come, he's going to rule and sit, on a throne, connects his priestly work with his kingly work, and that, of course, begins to tie this priestly office to the messianic uh, mission as well. So it, it's hard to, to be too hard on the Jews of the first century because it would have been very difficult for them to put all this together. How do you have someone not only be a priest, but also be a king, and also be a prophet? And then when you add to that something like the suffering servant from Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, it's really difficult to, to see how these things are going to fit together. It's not until you, you put on your Christ glasses, read the New Testament, and look back at these passages in the Old Testament that those kinds of things become clear. Now this is what the author of the book of Hebrews does throughout. 
Although he's the only New Testament writer who applies the term priest to our Lord, he repeatedly speaks of Jesus as a priest. He says this in Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. In other words, this is the one whom we confess. We confess him as our great high priest who's passed through the heavens. This is what we as Christians confess about him. And he goes on to say that since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Again, remember that the pastoral issue in the book of Hebrews is the author's writing to a church composed largely of Jewish Christians who have converted to Christianity. They're now feeling the pressure of their Jewish friends and family uh, being treated as outcasts. There's probably some persecution from the civil authorities. And so many of these people have left Christianity and gone back to the synagogue. And so Jesus is saying to these people, or the author of the Hebrews is saying to these people, look, if Christ is superior and has passed through the heavens already, having completed his high priestly work, why would you want to go back to the inferior and to the animal sacrifices and to all those things that foreshadowed the coming of Christ? You're basically arguing that redemptive history has taken a giant U-turn. And the author of the Hebrews is imploring them, don't do this. It's apostasy to, to give up on the merits of Christ and return to the animal sacrifices. And we have the famous apostasy language in Hebrews chapter 6. So he goes on then to make this case Christ is superior. He's become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's the kind of high priest, the author says in Hebrews 7, who has no need, like those other high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. Just remarkable language that Christ has already done this. He has accomplished all of these things for us. He's not only the great high priest, he's not a superior to all things, but his work is said to be once and for all. So Christians then take heart, the author says in Hebrews 8.1, because our high priest is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, there's not only a great deal of biblical data about Christ's high priest, uh, high priestly office, but Scripture pushes us in a couple of related directions, and we don't have time to do much more than just skim them here. But not only is Christ the high priest who offers this once-for-all sacrifice for sin, his sacrifice is once-for-all and that much better because he himself is the sacrifice. And we get a strong hint of this in the Mosaic economy, the Mosaic era of redemptive history when the Sinaitic covenants in force through those sacrifices that were instituted because they themselves were mere types and shadows that pointed the people of God ahead to a Messiah yet to come. Now the sacrifices during that time, as you know, uh, temporarily expiated the guilt of the sins of the people through the offering of a substitute. In this case, the animal who was offered up to God. Not only uh, was the animal sacrificed, but uh, they had the burnt offerings and so on. And those sacrifices are temporary and provisional only because they're in anticipation of the great sacrifice that Christ will perform. And so the psalmist then says, In sacrifice and offering you've not delighted, but you've given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you've not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, your laws in my heart. The words of Psalm 40. So the Messiah then, in that psalm, is indicating that his own sacrificial death is going to supersede, is going to supersede and, and make obsolete the entire Old Testament sacrificial system. It's just remarkable how these threads come together in the biblical account. Now the New Testament quite frequently and very powerfully makes this very point, that Christ's sacrificial death is the fulfillment of all the types and the shadows of that whole Sinaitic covenant, that whole Mosaic economy. And again, the author of the Hebrews is but one example makes it very clear that our Lord Jesus, through his one sacrifice, has done something that the blood of bulls and goats could never do, and that is take away sin. And through that sacrifice of Christ, through that sacrifice once for all, the author says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, we have been 
made holy. Can the blood of bulls and goats assuage our consciences? The author of Hebrews says no. Can the blood of bulls and goats turn aside God's wrath and anger towards us only for a time because it anticipates the great sacrifice yet to come? But by this sacrifice, by the sacrifice of Christ, the author of Hebrews says, we have been made holy. And the emphasis is on the completed act here. We have been made holy. So all of you watching, all of you here are saints. Saint Lane. It just fits. It just fits. But as we saw when we covered the prophetic office, not only did Christ's prophetic work not cease when he completed his earthly ministry, so his priestly work continues on as well. Christ took his place at the right hand of the Father because his redemptive work was finished. We know this from Hebrews 11, verse 12. And Jesus presently intercedes for us when we sin. The famous passage in 1 John chapter 1 and 2. If we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For we have one, my dear children, if anybody does sin, no, that qualifier. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So we have a priest who now intercedes for us presently when we sin, applying to us his once shed blood. Furthermore, we know from John chapter 17, verse 17, that Jesus is actually, in his priestly work, praying for our sanctification. It's Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that's preparing us, his people, to be Christ's own bride, without stain or wrinkle or blemish. And Christ is doing this now for us in his priestly work, praying for our sanctification. And as the author of the Hebrew puts it, Hebrews puts it back in chapter 4 of Hebrews, he's now our great high priest who's gone through the heavens. So now, he says, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So the priestly work of Christ extends into the present. So not only is Christ forgiving us of our sins and we confess them, his once shed blood being applied to us, he's also praying for our sanctification. And because he suffered and been tempted in all ways as we have yet without sin, we have a high priest who can help us in time of mercy. And then as Peter says in his first letter, second chapter, verse 5, our high priest is even now building us up, he says, into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When we worship on Sunday, we don't bring the fatted calf. We don't bring our goats without spot or blemish. Uh, I don't butcher anything on Sunday mornings. Um, we don't hide what we do behind a veil. We don't have a golden uh, barbecue pit and burn what's left over. Why not? Because our high priest has made that once for all sacrifice. And so now we're all priests. And what, sac- do, what sacrifice do we make on the Lord's day when we assemble together? We offer our sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving for what Christ has done for us. So it, it's, a, it's a remarkable point. And what comfort we take from knowing that Christ is in heaven, preparing us for his glory. We have a great high priest who intercedes for us, and that great high priest never sleeps. He never wearies. He doesn't get tired of praying for me despite all the habitual and perpetual and ridiculous things that I I do. He never prays without full effect. You know, Christ in his intercessory office is praying for us. Can those prayers not be heard? Can those prayers not be answered? Of course not. He's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. Scripture says, and he's our great high priest. He's the good shepherd who even now guards his flock. And I love the words from John chapter 10. No one will ever snatch us from his hand. And then Paul in Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from his love. So we not only have Christ's prophetic work continuing on into the present, we also have his priestly work continuing on into the present as well. Well, that brings us to the third aspect, Christ our King. And I, I dare say this is the one about which most people are the most confused and one about which the Reformed have not 
been as clear as we should be. And I think as we go through this section, you'll see the kinds of things I'm hinting at here. That uh, Think through this in the classical reform categories, and a lot of the contemporary debates in the reformed and evangelical world kind of come into some clarity here. So you'll see what I mean in short order. Now, it's my contention that the biblical writers would be utterly mystified at much of the evangelical discussion about making Christ Lord. Um, as though it was through a decision on our part that Christ becomes the Lord over our lives. I think that would utterly flabbergast the biblical writers. And they certainly would have been, I think, equally perplexed about hearing that um, American nationalism was somehow part of the kingdom of God, or that social justice was somehow part of the kingdom of God. I think the biblical writers would be utterly perplexed at our ability to turn theological and spiritual categories into political ones. I think that would take them aback greatly. I think they'd be very confused by our dispensational brothers and sisters who insist on undercutting the present reign of Christ by arguing that Christ's kingly office, specifically the regnum gratia, uh, the kingdom of grace, that it doesn't come into fullness until the millennial age commences and at long last Jesus supposedly begins to exercise his full authority over the earth from this earthly city of Jerusalem. And I think much of this stuff comes from a failure to understand this third office of Christ, his kingly rule. Now the scriptures are just crystal clear from Psalm 103 that the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Uh, We don't make Christ Lord over anything. He is Lord over all creation. His throne is in heaven and he's king over all creation. And so his kingship then has to be seen as his official power to rule all things in heaven and on earth for the glory of God and for the execution of God's purpose of salvation. So his kingly office entails a number of very, very important things. Now, I ask you, If Christ isn't ruling in that present capacity, if he's waiting to come back and establish his millennial kingdom, then just who exactly is minding the store in the meantime? Uh, The Reformed have been arguing all along that this kingly rule, which is present, has two aspects. The first of these is the regna potentia, that is the kingdom of power. Uh, Some of us speak of that as the civil kingdom. This is Christ's sovereign rule over all the affairs of men and nations. And the second aspect of this is the regnum gratia, or the kingdom of grace, or as many of us speak, the kingdom of Christ. This has to deal with the Christ's lordship and protection of his church. Now, unlike our dispensational friends who argue that Christ delays the full manifestation of his rule in this present dispensation, the Reformed have stated all along that Christ presently exercises full dominion over all, even now. That raises some apologetics questions. We don't have time to to address those, but we're aware that those come up, and we can talk about that another time. But Christ exercises full dominion even now. He is a king, and his kingdom is presently a kingdom both of grace and of power. He's in full control over everything. He's ordering all of human history as he sees fit. And as we watch the news every day, we see Christ's eternal decree play out in human history. And so this means that as his ascension, Jesus ascended to the right hand of God and even now rules as sovereign Lord over all creation and over his church in his specific office as mediator in these threefold offices of prophet, priest, and king. So Christ's rule over his church is different from the way he sovereignly rules over the nations. To the nations, he's the sovereign Lord. To the church, he's the covenant mediator and our prophet, priest, and our king. Now, in the kingdom of grace, this kingdom of Christ, Christ is seen to rule the church, of which he himself is the head. So, the Reformed understanding of ecclesiology, the church is the assembly of the called out ones, ruled by ministers, elders, and deacons. That's part of Christ's kingly work. And as such, this rule is a spiritual rule because it's exercised in a spiritual realm primarily in and through the word and sacrament ministry of the church. So the paradox here is, we're expecting the kingdom of God to fill a stadium. 
with lots of activity and noise and sound and, and parking lot full and you know, television broadcasts and everything else. And yet the kingdom of God is advancing in every little neighborhood church where the minister is preaching Christ and the scriptures and administering the sacraments according to the word of God and that congregation is disciplining its members. The kingdom of God is under the radar. We're tending to look for the kingdom of God in powerful ways. But as Luther said, you're going to find the kingdom of God manifested on a cross and in a cradle, not in the theology of glory. So we believe that Christ rules over all things. It's a spiritual rule. The New Testament, as you know, repeatedly speaks of Christ as the head of his church. Uh, And the church, of course, is his mystical body. Uh, And we're described then as that body over which Christ rules and reigns. Now, Christ's rule over this kingdom is tied to his redemptive work. Not one person, Burkhoff says, is a citizen of this kingdom by virtue of his humanity. Only the redeemed have that honor and privilege. So we make a distinction. Christ rules as sovereign Lord over everyone who's ever been born in each and every age, but he's only redeemer and rules his church as king only over those who are of his elect, those who have been chosen by God, for whom Christ has died, and who have been called to faith by the Spirit. So this is a spiritual kingdom. It doesn't have a flag. It doesn't have a logo. It doesn't have a P.O. box. It doesn't have a CEO or a CFO. It's a spiritual kingdom. But it's very powerful. And it's present wherever Christ's people gather to hear the word, proclaim, and receive the sacraments. This kingdom is identical to what the New Testament calls the kingdom of God. Now lest we forget, this kingdom is a conquering kingdom. Matthew chapter 12 makes this very clear. But we err if we connect that kingdom to cultural or economic or political institutions. As Jesus himself said, my kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God isn't tied to economic progress or to a particular political system or to uh, cultural or social or economic gains. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not of this world. In Galatians 5, Jesus says the wicked are not going to inherit this kingdom. Though our children, seen by the world as the least of these, are already members of that kingdom, according to Luke chapter 18, verse 16. Just utterly remarkable. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's a glorious kingdom. And despite what unbelievers around us say, it's a present reality. What did John the Baptist come preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right up under your nose. It's as close as you can get without it being fully realized. It's a kingdom which the creed says has no end. But the kingdom of power, on the other hand, refers to Christ's rule or his dominion over all creation. As creator of all, Jesus is also Lord of all. He orders the affairs of men and nations. He controls the lives and destinies of individuals. The scripture puts it this way. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that pleases him. And that serves as the basis for understanding all of human history as the serving the ultimate purpose of the redemption of God's people because we know that God is working all things together after the purpose of his will and that he is ordering all things so that human history is racing to this great and final climax which is the return of our Lord Jesus to earth to raise the dead, to judge the world and make all things new. And it's in this kingly rule that Christ gives us comfort in the midst of the tumult we see around us when We're worried about the economy, and we're worried about wars throughout the Middle East, and we're worried about terrorism. The reason we don't panic is because Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the sovereign king and rules over all the affairs of men and nations, and nothing befalls us. This is not part of his plan and purpose for us. Well, I'd like to make some final thoughts and uh, try and summarize some of this as, as best we can and just draw a few quick points of application. Now, We've just scratched the surface here, and as you've gathered, the threefold office here has very profound ramifications for all the Christian life. First and foremost, this model enables, enables us to connect the work of Christ, who secured our redemption, which we discover only in the pages of Scripture, with our present experience and struggles as Christians. Christians. 
This is one great way to connect the Jesus of history to my life right here and now. The threefold office is a very helpful way to do that. As Calvin himself pointed out, the threefold office of Christ is one of the best ways to explain our Lord's redemptive work. And in Turretin, we see that Christ in these threefold offices has overcome our ignorance, our guilt, and our corruption. And even now, provides us with illumination, redemption, and hope in the present. Let me do a little application here as we we conclude. Uh, Take Christ's prophetic office, for example. How does that impact us now? We mentioned the Old Testament and the antecedents. We looked at some of the New Testament teaching. How does that impact me now? Well, Christ was revealed in types and shadows in the Old Testament. And though he's the central character throughout the Old Testament, he remains hidden in these types and shadows. In the New Testament, Jesus steps out from the types and shadows, and he assumes center stage in the drama of redemption. Galatians 4.4, 4, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those born under the law. Well, that's then. This is now. What's he do for me after the ascension? After he's finished his earthly ministry? Well, his prophetic office, I think, helps us here. Perhaps it would be useful to think of it this way. If the scripture bears witness to Christ, then the Holy Spirit, who is scripture's divine author, will open our minds and hearts to hear our Lord's voice as we read his word. The Reformed have always connected the work of the Spirit to the written text, so that the same Spirit who inspired Scripture is the same one who illumines my mind and heart to understand Scripture in the present, so that I can believe when I hear the Bible being read, I read it myself, that God is speaking to me. This is what theologians have, at least on our side of the coin, have called illumination. If we're blind to the things of God because of sin, then the Holy Spirit must provide the understanding of Scripture that we need. And so Christ, as our prophet then, is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. He's the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He's the one then who speaks to us through his word in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, If you've ever been to a Reformed church, it's rightly ordered that has the proper Reformed liturgy, What is done before and after the scripture lessons? A prayer is offered that God would enable us to understand his word, that the same spirit who inspired the authors would help us to understand these words in fact today. And one of the little themes in Reformed theology is that Calvin himself believed that when the minister or the elders read the text of scripture, it were as though God himself were speaking to us in the service. We take that very, very seriously. So uh, in scripture then we have God's word written. And unlike the musings of men who claim that God is speaking to them, or who claim the Holy Spirit has revealed certain things to them, in Scripture we have a voice that is certain. We have a voice that's clear. And therefore we're safe listening to what Scripture says and believing when we hear Scripture read and we read it for ourselves that God is speaking to us through the pages of His Word. That's what the prophetic office of Christ means to me in the present. It's pretty remarkable. The same pattern holds for Christ's priestly work. Not only has Christ done what's necessary for our salvation through his sinless life, his active obedience, but in his sacrifice for sin, he also then suffered all the punishment that I rightly deserve. He now at this very moment, as we gather here on a Wednesday night in Anaheim, he has already assumed his place at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing even now? He's interceding for us. And where is he? He's at the right hand of the Father. And what wonderful comfort it is to know that our Savior, who is like us in all ways yet without sin, who suffered, who empathizes with our sinfulness and our weakness, although he was without sin, he certainly understands what we experience and how we endure sin and the consequences of sin upon us. What comfort we gather from knowing that our Savior is right there in heaven pleading for us. Our high priest knows our weaknesses. And it's to him that we pray, and it's he that we ask for help when we need it. And let's not forget that he's promised that he'll never give us more than we can bear. And he's always promised us a way of escape. So in his priestly work, Christ is even now interceding for us, praying for us that our faith will not fail. And then there's Christ's kingly office. Uh, We could spend hours talking about how this doctrine should be the proper understanding of the Christian view of sanctification. 
Because Christ in his kingly office, through the word and through the sacraments, is ruling over my sinful heart so that I am indeed being conformed to the image of Christ. So we have that category as well, and I would really encourage you to read more and study that on your own. We also know, because of Christ's present kingly office, that when the nations rage against one another, when the earth shakes beneath our feet, when we hear that loved ones are ill, when death comes, when there's economic hardship as we see all around us, we know that even in the middle of that, Our Lord is ruling and reigning until he makes his enemies a footstool for his feet. Unbelievers see all of that and they scoff and they say, Where is this coming that you've promised? But we take heart because we know that the signs of the end are exactly that. They're not signs that nobody's watching the store. They're signs that guarantee that Christ is going to come back to put an end to all of that. So we see the signs as a guarantee of our Lord's return to judge the world and raise the dead and make all things new. We see those same signs as as the proof that Christ is ruling and reigning and directing all of history to his uh, appointed end and to a final consummation when he comes as the all-conquering king with the glory of his angels. So in the hour we've just spent, we have just scratched the surface of this very, very rich and manifold theme in scripture and it's our hope and it's our comfort that Jesus Christ is God's final prophet he is our great high priest he is the all conquering king so at the end of the day there is a miraculous cure for ignorance and guilt and pollution after all and that marvelous cure that miraculous cure is long been described by Reformed theologians as the triple cure. It was Calvin who said in response to this, he said, God has fulfilled what he's promised. That the truth of his promises would be realized always in the person of his Son. Believers are to be found affirming Paul's wonderful saying that all the promises of God find their yea and amen in Christ. So that's a good point at which to, to quit. I'd like to take some questions, so if any of you have any questions, feel free to ask them where you are, and I will restate them for the camera. Wow, there's so many hands, I don't know who I'm going to take first. Yeah. (laughs) Um, As briefly as you want, um, kind of contrast the Reformed view of Christ as priest and the Roman Catholic. Okay, it's a great question about the contrast between the uh, reformed understanding of Christ's present priesthood in the, in the Roman Catholic position. Well, the Reformed have, have long said that the issue for Rome, why we find the Roman Mass especially so offensive as Protestants, is that the supposed once sacrifice for Christ is now repeated on earthly altars by earthly priests as, as Roman Catholics become an unbloodied sacrifice. Our concern isn't the ongoing priestly work of Christ because at least on the Reformed side, we've always believed that Christ's priestly office has an ongoing effect and that we are to pray for that our sins to be forgiven and His once shed blood is applied to us. But not on an earthly altar, not on an, by an earthly priest, and not to propitiate sins. So, I think Protestants have long said the book of Hebrews, especially the language of, of the high priest, what the high priest does, the once for all nature of his sacrifice, is a serious theological impediment for Roman Catholicism and its notion of the Mass as some sort of, of re sacrifice of Christ. And I think our understanding of the threefold office really chops out from under the Roman notion this idea of, of the church somehow, the officers of the church, given the Roman understanding of the priesthood, is able to, to turn aside God's wrath through these sacrifices. Now, all of that is to say we as Reformed Christians, and I think following Scripture, ought to be making sacrifices on Sunday morning because we're all priests. But the sacrifices we make are not for sin because that's a once-for-all sacrifice. We come and we bring our sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving for what God has done for us in Christ. So the Reformers were not as offended by the ongoingness of Rome's system but that it was undercutting the sufficiency of the once-for-all sacrifice for Christ, and in effect saying it's not complete, that it didn't do enough. And that explains why Rome is always nervous to say we're just how the merits of Christ are seen by faith alone, and, and Rome will have to say, well, 
It's the grace of God infused into me that begins the process of my transformation from sinner into saint so that I actually now do good works that's, that merit a reward from God. And, and I think we see that very effectively challenged by this, this model. And, and not only are we challenging Rome, but we're, we're, I think, circumventing the issues that Catholic apologists raise today when they try and you know, convert people to Romanism. We've got an answer to the, to the ongoing priestly office. Good question. Any others? Yes, sir. Um, how does an understanding of the great old uh, office of Christ, how does it affect ministry? Um, okay, a, a very profound question. How does the threefold office affect one's understanding of the ministry? Okay. First of all, it gives the church directions to what the church is supposed to do. Um, if Christ extends his, his kingdom as mediator of a covenant and through these threefold offices, then we kind of have our, our marching orders set very clearly before us. We know that the Great Commission is to go into the nations and to make disciples. And how do we make disciples? By baptizing them and then teaching. We know that the last time Jesus was together with his disciples... He radically transformed the Passover into the Last Supper and the Lord's Supper and then told his people, whenever you do this, whenever you assemble, do this in remembrance of me. We know from the opening chapters of the book of Acts that the early church was cognizant of God speaking to them in Christ through preaching. Then you go to a passage like Acts 2.42 and you're very clearly told that the ministry of the church's word, sacrament, fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers, and so on, all those things are related to the threefold offices of Christ. So it not only tells us the content of what we're to preach, but it, it tells the church what the church is to be focusing upon. And that is preaching the gospel, administering the sacraments, disciplining erring members, and in all of that we see the threefold offices of, offices of Christ. To, to give you some specifics, word effects preaching is... When Christ is exalted in the preaching of the gospel, his kingly office manifests itself in that through the preached word, God solely subdues your sinful nature and my sinful nature. So instead of me encouraging people to go off and see some mountaintop experience to improve their, their Christian life and have this dramatic experience where now they've cleaned up this, that, and the other, I think that's going to take the form of the ordinary preaching ministry of the church. Um, if I want to have an experience of God, and I, I, the language even kind of creeps me out to even, to even speak that way, um, but you know, Christians will often uh, claim that they are desirous of such a thing. Uh, I prefer immediate experience of God. Um, if we were to experience God apart from Christ, we would be ashes. We would be instantly consumed. So, for God to speak to me through Christ, through written words, is his way of accommodating his holiness to my sinfulness in such a way that I can hear his voice and not be like the Israelites around Mount Sinai. Don't let God speak to us or we're going to die. Have Moses tell us what you said, but don't speak to us. That's gone. We can actually hear God speak to us because his word has been accommodated to us in Scripture. It's without error and all that it affirms, and it's accommodated to us in our need. That's just another place. The priestly word. Um, where this impacts us greatly is anytime I sin, I know that I have a high priest who loves me, who cares for me, who's invited me to come and confess my sins, not to run and hide from him. And so in Christ's priestly office, he is telling us if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just. I'll forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we not only have you know, uh, God coming to us and speaking to us, we now have God ruling over our hearts and subduing our sin. We also have a high priest who empathizes and who understands. So I think in a lot of ways, and I'm not being facetious here, the job of the minister, as, as Calvin said, is to assure the people of God of God's favor toward them in Christ. And these threefold offices enable us to do that. It also reminds the minister to show forth Christ and then to get out of the way. That, yeah. 
Um, the question is how much do I think the lack of understanding of this model contributes to the chaos we see in contemporary evangelicalism? Well, I think having these categories in place answers a lot of the questions that evangelicals are wrestling with today. Uh, questions about worship and style, question about the perpetuity of, of gifts of the Spirit and what those look like, um, questions related to uh, what we should do on Sunday, liturgy versus free worship. You know, All those questions are kind of obliquely addressed by that. It also gets to the question of Christian ethics. Um, one of the reasons I like the two-kingdom model and the, re- the Reformed expression of it, it grows out of my understanding of Christ's priestly rule. Uh, it would explain, for example, why I don't think the, the church is to be about the business of politics. It explains why uh, Christian citizens should be about the business of politics. It explains to me why sanctification is not tied to some experiential kind of thing or a crisis experience, but to Christ. I mean, it, it speaks to all of those things. And, and, and I think if we got some of these classical categories back, uh, we would not only not have to reinvent the wheel, but if we, this wheel's a lot rounder than the wheel we're, we're trying to use. Any other Well, let's close in prayer. Our gracious God, we have considered this wonderful topic of the work of our blessed Savior Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And we're reminded yet again, Lord, of our guilt and our ignorance and our corruption. But we're not left there. We're pointed to a Savior who has died for our sins, who was raised for our justification was ascended on high, who's poured forth his Holy Spirit into our hearts, and now rules and reigns as Lord and Savior, prophet, priest, and king. And for that we give you thanks and praise in Christ's blessed name. Amen.